Mm -hmm. It's going. Okay, so welcome to my birth class, Empowered Birth. My name is Nisa Anderson. Um, the first things I wanted to let you know is obviously I want you guys to bring, you know, if you want to eat and drink, please do. I want you to stay hydrated. Um, the bathrooms, if you're not familiar with where we are, are just down the hall. It's the first place you can turn right, and so bathrooms are down there. Um, the cafeteria is not open, but they have left, you can go get water over there, and they did leave us some iced tea, so, or some tea that you can make for yourself. So uh, those are a couple of the amenities that are available. In your folders in front of you, there is, um, there's one form that I need you to just sign. It is a photo release form. So no, I'm not going to put your video anywhere, but um, if we do take some pictures, I would just like to be able to put them on my, uh, my Facebook page and possibly the ICEA Facebook page, but um, that'll be the only places that they're put. So if you're comfortable with that, please go ahead and sign and date that, and I'll take them up later. Um, and I guess the first thing I would say is that, you know, we're going to focus today on how to have an empowered birth, how to um, get through this birth, you know, on your own without any, you know, additional help and, and hopefully... I'm going to give you the tools that you need to do that today. Um, I'm trying to think if there was anything else I wanted to cover before we just jump right in. Um, okay, well, back to the the snacks and drinks because that kind of leads into my first slide. Um, you know, I mentioned I want you guys to stay hydrated and eat plenty throughout the day. I know that the further along that you get, um, you know, the more little meals you need to eat. So please just feel free to do that, and we'll have our lunch brought in around 11:30, I think. Um, but that is the first thing we're going to talk about is nutrition. Um, this may just sound pretty, you know, common sense, but you definitely want to keep, you know, eating and drinking plenty, especially the drinking part of it, because everything that you put in your body, obviously, first goes to your baby. You know, everything goes to your baby first. So if there's, if you're even close to dehydration, you know, your baby's going to get all that, all that liquid that's in you, and you're going to, you're going to get dehydrated a lot faster because the baby needs that. So just want to remind you to eat and drink. Um, plenty of water, eat your proteins, fruits, and vegetables, you know, just be healthy, eat healthy. Um, when it comes to avoiding foods, I'm sure you've talked with your doctors about some of those things. I'm not going to go into details because I know that changes. I know when I was pregnant, you weren't supposed to eat lunch meat. Is that still a thing? Okay. So, and I know that, you know, several years before I was pregnant, people thought that, you know, they didn't, they'd never heard of that. So, whatever your doctor says is, you know, not good for you to eat, don't eat it or drink it. Um, cut back on your caffeine, follow their orders on alcohol. I know for me, cutting back on caffeine was the worst, but, um, and if you are currently smoking, I highly encourage you to quit, obviously, and I've, there's a 1-800 number there that you can call to get help, um, and also avoid being around it as much as you can, because you're, you're responsible for the health of this new little one, so. Um, and then for, which, oh. I need to back up here in a second, but the further along you are in your pregnancy, um, especially for first times, you're going to figure out that your stomach loses a lot of its capacity. So you're going to find that it's a lot more comfortable to eat small meals throughout the day, because if you try to eat like a normal big old meal for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you, oh, it's just brutal because you're so full and because you just don't have any room. So as you get further along, you're going to want to you know, keep food on hand and just eat small portions all throughout the day. Um, and I just realized what I forgot to do is I want to have you guys introduce yourselves um, and hopefully, maybe, is that them coming? Can you see? No? See. Okay. I thought maybe it was them. But I totally forgot to, to go around the room and have you guys introduce yourself. Now, if anybody, I don't think you guys are, but if anybody's terrified of speaking, you can just tell me your name and move on. But um, go ahead and tell us your name, maybe when you're due, um, anything you want to tell us, what you're having if you want to share or... Um. Michelle Burns, <coughs> having a boy in July 10th. Okay. <coughs> so you got a little while. Yeah. <laughs> It'll seem like forever, but that's okay. Um, Deanna Morris, I'm having a little boy as well. I'm due June 14th. Okay. All right. And now, so you you said you have kids, right? So is this I have one previous. You have one. And she okay. She turned a year on the 29th of last month. Okay. So some of this is going to be, you know, old hat. You're going to know a lot of these things. But anyways, all right. Well, we're going to move on to a little bit more about your nutrition and your environment. 
Um, something you guys may not think of is the stuff that you're putting on your skin as well as what you're putting in your body while you're pregnant. Um, there's a lot of personal care products or cleaning products, um, things that you should definitely avoid. Um, so when you're looking at your personal care products like your lotions and your shampoos and your face creams and stuff like that, you want to look for those ingredients to make sure that they're not included in that because those things are just stuff that you don't want seeping into your skin and going into the rest of your system. Um, same with food additives. Cleaning products, this is a big one. So, you know, if you love to clean with bleach and stuff like that, I would recommend, at least while you're pregnant, maybe avoiding that or wearing masks and gloves and all that kind of stuff because there's chemicals that you don't want getting into your, your skin. Um, we're about to come up on planting season. I'm so excited. I can't wait to plant my gardens. Um, but you definitely want to avoid doing any herbicides or pesticides and things like that while you're pregnant. You know, make, make your husbands do it. They're, you know, say, sorry, I can't, I can't help. Um, and also plastics, if you can avoid plastic food containers. And the next slide here will give you some alternatives to these things. Um, Castile soaps and glycerin soaps and plant-based um, products are going to be, um, you know, better for your skin and better for, for baby. Um, food additives, just check your, your uh, labels for, you know, things that don't contain. You know, you can buy organic. I mean, that's, that's a pretty safe way to go because you're going to avoid all those things that you're not wanting to have in there. Um, for cleaning products, um, a good alternative for right now, I mean, if, like I said, if you love to clean with, you know, the high-powered stuff, maybe just, just hold off for now. Um, and you can use butter <coughs> and baking soda and lemon juice, combination of those. You can just look up, you know, recipes of how to mix up your own stuff. Um, same with the lawn care products. Either just make him do it or find something natural. Um, and then with... The plastics, you can switch to glass or stainless steel or bamboo, things like that. Now, I'm going to give you guys a website if you've not heard of it. And that's actually, you can get an app on your phone. But this is really great for um, checking your personal care products. So if you're, and this is great for when baby gets here too. So if you're looking for a new lotion, like if you go home and look at yours and see that it's full of all kinds of chemicals that you don't want, um, you can go on this website and look up different um specific products you like if you have a product you can look it up that one specifically some of them you can scan them if they're in the system you can scan the barcode um, or if you just need to find a new one you can go on there and just click you know baby lotions and it'll give you a list of their uh, top products you know from least toxic you know from like their zero all the way up to a 10 so obviously you want to avoid the tens and you want to get the least toxic products um, some of them you can find on Amazon, some of them you can find in drugstores. What I often will do when I'm looking for a new product, like I needed a new face moisturizer, so I went out and just Googled top 10 drugstore low toxin face products or whatever, and, and somebody had already done the legwork for me and they had listed a bunch of lotions, and then I took those lotions and put them into this website <coughs> and found where they were you know, listed, and then I went and bought the, the least, you know, like they had a two or a three instead of a six or a seven. Um, and then it's still a reasonable price. But this is great for when you're starting to look for baby stuff, you know, like for the lotions and um, you don't really, this is just FYI, you don't really need baby powder. That's not a thing that used to be, but you don't need, you really don't need baby powder, especially with girls, which I guess that doesn't matter. Um, but, you know, if you're looking for, like I said, lotions or um, shampoos or soaps, what else do we put on babies? <coughs> Any of those kind of things that, you, that you're looking for, this is a great site to help you find something that's safer. Um, okay. Now this doesn't include any cleaning products on this site, so that, like I said, you can go, out, you can go on Pinterest and get recipes for mixing up. Or you can buy, I think there's Myers brand. Um, I know Target has a low toxin brand, but anyways, you can look for other stuff if you don't want to mix up your own at home. Okay. So, one of the key um, foundations of the ICEA program is family-centered maternity care. Um, and so, you know, years ago, you know, husbands weren't even in the room when you were giving birth, right? So, ICEA, I think it was like early 60s is when they, when they first formed, and this was when they were starting to encourage husbands to come back into the birth room or to be in the birth room so that the mom is not in there all by herself. Um, so, you know, the, the beginning of this and their foundation of, of that 
thinking of having more support and having more people in the room and kind of getting back to a more natural way of giving birth and a more comfortable setting of giving birth, um, they develop the, their ideas in the Family Centered Maternity Care, which basically says birth is a normal, healthy process for most women. I mean, yes, you're going to have the, the people that do have some additional complications, but for most people, it's healthy and it's normal. It's not an illness. It's not a sickness. It doesn't need to be treated. It just needs to be, it just needs to happen. You know, the doctors don't need to doctor anything most of the time. Um, <clears throat> your care should be individualized to you what your needs are, what your wishes are. Um, you know, you're not a cookie cutter person. Not every birth is the same. Your birth might be super quick. Your birth might be super long. It, you know, there's no, there's no set rules of how birth is supposed to go. It's individualized. Your provider and your caregivers, your nurses, the people that, that are there with you this whole time, they need to be mm -hmm. respectful of you. They need to listen to your wishes they need to explain everything fully I mean the, the open communication is key because when you don't know what's going on it's scary and we'll get into that on what fear does to you when you're in birth but one of their key things is that it should be catered to you and it should be respectful so if you don't feel respected at any given time in your care with your doctor you need to think long and hard about whether or not you want to be with that doctor anymore um, you know, respect is, is just, it's a key part of this whole process. So like I said, if you don't feel respected, then sit down and talk about it and think if, if you want to stay with that person. But, or talk to that doctor about it. Say, I feel very disrespected that you didn't, you know, explain that very well or, or you know, however they made you feel. Um, you want to feel respected in this whole process so that when you're actually in labor, you feel comfortable and calm and you trust that person that's in the room with you. Um, decision making should be a collaborative effort collaborative effort between the pregnant woman and the healthcare providers, which just again means open communication. Um, the education that we're going to talk about today or that you receive from your doctor should be evidence-based um, and current. So if you question anything that, that I say or that a doctor says, you know, go look it up. We have all kinds of information at our fingertips. Make sure you're looking at respectable, you know, trustworthy sites. But if, if you don't feel comfortable with something that, that they say is possibly going to happen or how they do how they do birth, go look it up and see if it's evidence-based and if it's current or if there's maybe a newer, you know, idea or thinking about it, okay? Um, so again, information should be shared freely between everyone and they they feel strongly about rooming in, which I know that Woodward rooms in. I should ask you that. Where are you, are you going to be delivering? Woodward as well. Okay. So they very much encourage rooming in, which is great. That is what's best for baby and mom. Um, you know, we'll get into this later, but the way I look at it, you've been your baby's home for nine months. It doesn't just automatically change. Your body is still that baby's home for, you know, at least a month afterwards. I mean, that baby can just live right here, and that's totally fine. Now, your moms and other people are going to want to hold that baby, but it should come right back to you, and that's, that's where baby wants to be. That's been the home for nine months. Don't just, you know, evict them and say, okay, well, you know, go lay in the nursery, you know, in the hospital, and I'll see you when I see you. That's, they very much encourage having babies nearby, which also helps you guys get into sync with your sleeping, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. Uh, you want to have the presence of supportive people during labor. Um, it's beneficial to the mother and family. We're going to talk about that extensively. Can you, um, are you just getting the back of my head this whole time? Well, but that's okay. Um, mothers again are the preferred care providers for their children and fathers of course but you know that's basically saying we want the baby with you not being cared for necessarily in the nursery um, freedom of movement is beneficial for laboring women and should be encouraged routine interventions that are unsupported by scientific evidence should be avoided and again that's we're going to talk about that today about just how you can try your best and to do everything you can to avoid interventions um, all members of the healthcare team should be educated about physiologic birth and non-pharmacologic methods of pain management. Those are just, you know, big words to say natural, you know, mom-led birth, you know, if, as drug-free as possible. Um, and then we're going to talk about other forms of pain management that don't require drugs. That, that's what they're encouraging, obviously. 
um, and skin to skin contact immediately after birth and exclusive breastfeeding feeding should be standards of practice. So this is what ICEA encourages. Um, I'm on board with those things too. I, I, I don't, the exclusive breastfeeding thing, yes, I think that you should, I mean, I encourage everyone to try, but you know, I don't want, I don't want to put this. You don't want to pressure someone into only breastfeeding. Right. Formula is also an option. Right. Don't, don't make it such a thing that you, you turn yourself into a crazy person. Mm -hmm. I know people that have, I mean, it happens, it does. So, but we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. And do both of you know Sierra? Uh, Over at the Woodward. Lactation consultant? Yes. Yes. Okay. And and I found out that we're actually going to have a lactation consultant here, but they can be your best friend. Okay. Mm -hmm. They should be your best friend. And I highly encourage, you know, before and after, go visit. If you have any problems whatsoever, just go visit them. They will be a huge, huge help. Okay. All right. So, real quick before I get into the slide, um, I'm just going to give you a quick version of my birth stories just so that you kind of have it so that you know how I ended up here and why I ended up doing this um, first of all let me ask you this how many of you have heard like everybody's birth story around you do they all just they all want to tell you don't they yeah how many of you have heard like some really horrifying ones <laughs> right and and they're the ones that want to tell it to you tell it to you over and over and over and in great detail okay well we'll get we'll get to that in a second too mine aren't really horrifying but um, with my first child, um, towards the end of my pregnancy, um, they basically just said, well, you're measuring big, so we're gonna do an ultrasound. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna pause for a second. Pause for a second. Hello, hi, sorry for living. No, did I forget anything that we talked about earlier that I should, no? Okay, and so bear with me, because we are gonna have to stop occasionally and change over discs and stuff like that. Um, but one thing that I have not done is, say, first of all, if you have questions, please speak up and just, you know, you don't, you can raise your hand if you want to, or you can just ask me questions. Um, have you had any questions about anything we've covered so far? Okay. The other thing that I'm going to do, and I'll, I'll remember this here in a little bit to set it out there, I'm going to get your emails. So if you want any of these um, websites that we talk about, or just specific information that, that I've covered, if you want me to email you about it, I'd be happy to do that. There is notebook paper, I should have mentioned that too, in your uh, folder. So if you think of a question that you want to ask, you know, you can just ask it or if you want to write it down and ask later when, you know, one-on-one -on -one, um, or email me or whatever. Um, I just want to, if I don't know the answer, I will also make sure I get you the answer. And I'll be honest with you if I don't know. So, um, okay. So again, y'all are my guinea pigs, so bear with me. Hopefully this, this goes well. Um, what I was starting to say, and are we back on? Mm -hmm. Okay, I just want to make sure. Um, what I was starting to tell everybody uh, is a quick version of my birth story, just so you kind of know how I ended up doing what I'm doing. Um, and I asked them, and I'm assuming the same is true for you, or do you hear like every birth story of everyone around you? Like every woman is like, oh, let me tell you about my, which, I mean, I don't blame them. I do the same thing. I mean, I love to talk about birth, but what's frustrating is when you hear all the horror stories, right? and how it went so terribly wrong for them and how it was this painful and that, but you know, so we're gonna talk about that here in a little bit about how those type of stories, you just need to let them go in one ear and out the other. If you know that person's just gonna keep telling you that birth story, maybe just avoid them for a little while. You know, until the baby gets here, just, oh, you know, I can't hang out today. Or if they start to tell you, I've heard it, thanks. You know, I don't need to hear it anymore. But okay, we'll get into that and I'll tell you mine real quick. So. So my son, he is almost 12 now, but when I was pregnant with him, um, towards the end of my pregnancy, my doctor said, oh, you know, they took the measuring tape and said, oh, you're measuring kind of big. We need to do an ultrasound. So we did. And they said, well, he's, he's big. He's almost nine pounds. And so nine pounds is uh, my cutoff for a C-section, is how my doctor worded that to me. It's my cutoff for a C-section. Well. This is my first baby. I knew nothing about birth. And so to me, that was, that was it. Okay, well, I have to have a C-section. All right, so I went in, I did go into labor on my own and I went into the hospital and I said, well, I, my doctor said I have to have a C-section. So we did. Now, he was basically nine pounds. He was eight pounds, 15 ounces. So 
I'm not gonna say that that was not the best thing that could have happened. It probably was. I probably, I mean, he was a big baby. Not to say that you can't birth big babies, but neither here nor there, I had a C-section with him because I didn't know that I had the ability and the right and the option to say, okay, I understand that that's your policy, but I would like to try to give birth and try. You know, and then if it doesn't work, then we, we cross that bridge when we get there. I didn't know that. Okay, so, so I have him recovered from a C-section, which is not fun but it's all doable. And um, a couple of years later, I wasn't even, another baby wasn't even on the radar, but one of my friends told me to watch this documentary. It's called The Business of Being Born. I don't know if it's out on Netflix anymore or if you can find it, but it's a great, um, it's just a documentary about birth. And it just kind of talks about what birth has become in most hospitals around the country. Now granted, this documentary was probably made in the, late 90s, early 2000s, I would say, somewhere around there. Um, so I think things have improved, and there are a lot of doctors that are moving back to more natural procedures. But anyway, so I watched this documentary, and it opened my eyes to what birth can be. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind shutting that, thank you. Um, and kind of what it's been turned into, you know? Everybody being on the same you know, clocked schedule and, you know, this is how long it should take to have a baby. And if you go beyond that, well, then we need to start doing something about it. Anyway, so that's what the documentary kind of showed me. So whenever I decided, when my husband and I decided we wanted to have another one, I decided I wanted to have a VBAC, which is a vaginal birth after cesarean. Um, now, it's hard to find places out here that will do that. I happened to live in the city at the time, and OU Hospital did uh, vaginal births after cesarean. So... At that point, I made it my mission to learn about natural birth and learn about how to do that because nobody innately knows what to do during labor in order to get through it on your own. If you look back prior to, you know, the births being brought into the hospital and, you know, very sterilized and all that kind of stuff, if you look back prior to that time frame, what happened most of the time in a birth? Where did it take place? Home. Home. And who was there with you? Family. Right. So you had a, usually a local midwife that had birthed many, 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 many babies would show up. They would probably even have an apprentice because that's how that happened. You know, they they are birthing the baby and then they have somebody that's going to take over for them someday and they're coming and attending and learning. So they're just learning by experience and they're seeing how a natural birth happens. You have your aunts and your sisters and your moms and you have people in the room with you that have had a baby that know what to expect, that know what worked for them. So they're there to help you get through it and show you, hey, get in this position. Hey, try this, you know, try dancing. We'll get into that. I mean, try, try this, try that. You can do this. I've done it. You're fine. That's what, that's what the support system used to be like. When you take away all those people and women, and you know, you would even have young girls that hadn't had a baby, but they're still in the room helping and they're seeing what birth is like. They're seeing what you can do to get through birth and that it is a natural, normal function in life, right? So that's what was taken away from us is that we, know, we don't know unless you've had a baby, you have no idea what's coming because all you've ever seen is what's on TV and movies and the horror stories that you hear from people because that's what they wanna tell you. And so let me just tell you, since I have learned so much about birth, I have yet to see anything on TV or in a movie that is even remotely accurate, <laughs> okay? They're not like that. Do you guys remember the TV series? Um, it's probably on TLC, and I cannot think of the name of it, but it followed births, right? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? It's like so. a reality show, right? Where they like follow- Laying home baby? Something like that. They, they follow around a couple that is pregnant and you know and then they it's always right there at the end and then I kid you not every one of those labors turned into some sort of emergency because that's good TV right I mean if it was just oh look she's she's in labor and then she had a baby that's not gonna get you to watch it was the drama and the oh my gosh she's in danger and oh my gosh we have to take care of this you know that was what every single episode was so if you watch that stuff that's what you think birth is like Right? I mean, that's the only experience that we have been shown. So, 
All that to say, I kind of got off track there, that I decided to make it my mission to learn how to get through a birth. And I went to a birth class, and I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you. She taught me all kinds of things. Me and my husband, we both went to it together, and it was a one-day class, kind of like this. Um, when it actually came time to give birth, I remembered one thing from her class. I remembered her breathing technique. I mean, I just forgot everything else, but that breathing technique was what got me through my labor. And I was able to, I had a fairly, and I'm gonna be honest with you, I had a fairly easy labor, okay? And I'm not gonna you know, promise you that that's what everybody's <laughs> labor is like, but it was relatively quick. Um, it, you know, I just did the breathing technique and I made it through it and I had a baby and I didn't have any drugs, I didn't have any interventions whatsoever. It was peaceful and it was quiet it was a dark room. It was, um, you know, towards the end, yeah, I was hot and sweaty and a little bit, you know, thrashing and freaking out, you know, but that's what you're going to get to at some point. But the, everything leading up to that point was totally calm. No, no drama, no beeping, no, you know, shoving IVs in, no rushing me anywhere on a gurney. That, that wasn't what it was. And it was actually a beautiful experience. And when it was over, my baby's eyes were bright and open and she was looking at me on my chest and I was totally functioning. Every, I could get up and walk around. I was, it was great. I mean, I could go on and on and on, but you know, how often do you hear about a beautiful, calm birth experience? Very Probably right. never, right? So what I'm going to tell you right now is I encourage you for every one of the birth stories that you hear from somebody else that's like, oh, you know, horror, 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 it was so bad, hop online and Google midwife births, you know, Ina Mae Gaskin, I'll give you her name, she has a great book that if you, if you like to read, I'll, I'll give you the title of the book here in a little bit, um, the whole first section of her book is just stories about beautiful, you know, peaceful births, about baby coming into a calm, loving, quiet environment, okay? So for every one of those stories that you hear, go read one that's, that's the opposite of that, okay? So you can flush all that other stuff out of your mind. So, um, let me see. Okay, so we'll, let me just talk about the slide that you've been staring at for a while now. Um, yes, we're going to get into some techniques and some physical things that you can do that are going to help you get through labor, but the main thing is, is that you have to believe in yourself and you have to believe that your body can do this, okay? And this goes along with not listening to the crazy stuff, but listening to the people that have done it. You have to hear success stories to know that you can be successful. So you have to believe in yourself and you need to surround yourself with people that believe in you and that believe you can do this. Um, Okay, so everyone's birth story is going to be different. Um, and I will say this too, everybody's pain tolerance is different. You might be hearing Aunt May's story who, you know, cries when she pricks her finger or whatever. You know, like she might have a really low pain tolerance. So you can't take everything at face value, okay? I mean, they may, somebody may talk about how excruciating it was, but you're not them, okay? So keep that in mind too. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna give you an example of what I think about whenever, um, whenever I think about surrounding yourself with encouraging people, okay? So if you ever have a, like if you've set a goal in your life, right? Whether it be to go back to school or to get your beautician's license or to, like this is the first of the year and I know a lot of us have this idea of, oh, I wanna, I wanna get healthy, you know, I wanna, exercise more and, and get to this goal weight or I want to run a marathon or you know whatever your goal might be. So when you have that goal and you go to your significant other or you go to your mom or your mother-in-law or your sister, your cousin, whoever, if you go to people that they're supposed to be your support system and you tell them that goal, what do you hope their reaction is? What do you think their reaction should and would be? Positivity. Right. Encourage you right? That's great. I know you can do this. What can I do to help, right? That's what you hope for and what you expect from people that care about you, right? Especially if it's something that, that they know is good for you. You know, it, great. I think you would love to run a marathon. I wouldn't, <laughs> but you know, if that's what would be great for you and that's what you tell someone you want to do, 
I would hope that the people that are around you, that love you, that that's immediately what their reaction is going to be. Oh, that's great. I know you can do this. And what can I do to help? So their rea the reaction that you don't expect from people is, why? Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to do something so hard? Don't put yourself through that. You can't do it. Oh, trust me. You're not, I tried. You can't do it. Okay? Just don't even, there's no reason. Just take the easy way. Okay, I don't want to say take the easy way out, but don't even make the effort. Thank you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you wouldn't expect that from them for any other goal that you have in mind. So you should not expect that, or you should expect encouragement with this goal as well. Okay? You have done the research, obviously. You know that this ideally is the best scenario, best case scenario, is that you go in and you have a baby without any other interventions, without any complications, and you have your baby, right? And you don't have to have all these other needles and things and drugs and stuff because that's not what you want. So you, you've already done the research and you know this is what you want to at least strive for, okay? So surround yourself with people that are on board with that, okay? If somebody's popping into mind that is not that person, that is, that is the Debbie Downer, that is the negativity that's saying, you can't do this, I couldn't do it, so you can't, I'm going to tell you right now, first of all, please don't have that person in your labor and delivery room, okay? That is the last place that you need negativity. That is the last place that you need to be discouraged. We're going to talk about how encouragement Guys, this is your number one job. You're going to have other things that you're going to do, but if you remember nothing else from this class, your number one job is to be her cheerleader. All you have to do is say, you're so strong, you're doing so good, I'm so proud of you, and you will be surprised at how far that goes in helping her stay calm and confident and get through this. So, surround yourself with cheerleaders, okay? Um, so let's see if I've covered everything. So pain, I mean, I don't want you to focus on pain, but when you are having pain, it does have a purpose. The purpose is to get your baby here, right? So, you know, in any other scenario, if you're running a marathon or exercising or whatever, you're gonna go through pain, but you know that it has a purpose. Well, this has an even better purpose because you're gonna get a baby at the end of it, okay? So it has a purpose. You know it's coming. It's not like it's a big surprise. You know there's gonna be discomfort, but it's, you know, it's going to be fine. And it's intermittent. That's the other good part. Okay, like if you're running on a treadmill and you're huffing and puffing and you're getting that stitch in the side, it's not going away until you stop running, right? With this pain, it's intermittent. We're talking at the beginning, 30 seconds of pain. Maximum amount of like individual contraction, 90 seconds. You can handle 90 seconds. And just know that this is going to stop and I'm going to get a breather. Okay, so when you're in pain, if that helps you think, okay, this is not going to last forever. And it's totally normal. Okay? It is. It's just part of birth. That's just the way it goes. I mean, you're using muscles. That's the thing that I think about mm -hmm. sometimes is your uterus has never been used unless you've had another baby. It's a muscle in your body that's literally never been used. And all of a sudden, it's doing all this work. So it's totally normal that you're going to feel some pain. Okay? So, and I love this quote, giving birth should be your greatest achievement, not your greatest fear. And I think that we've turned birth into something to fear. You know, I mean, that's, that's what all of the media and people around us have done. So let's put all that aside. Don't watch any movies or any TV shows about births for a while, okay? Just turn that stuff off. And let's just keep that stuff out of our mind and think positive. Um, let me see, okay. So, and I have a little slide to help you remember. Sparkly. Surround yourself with positive people, okay? Surround yourself with the people you know <coughs> are on board with this, okay? And, and the ones that say, what can I do to help? Do you want me to be there in the room to, you know, relieve your husband or whatever? I can help. You know, the people that are going to be your cheerleaders, that's who you want. I might add a slide with cheerleaders on it. Just to... Okay. Real quick, does anybody have any questions? Do you guys want to take a break for bathrooms and drinks, or are you everybody doing okay? Okay, I'm going to get my water. Hang on. <clears throat> okay. Hang on. I'm moving.
moving along a little fast. I thought I would ramble more because I do. I ramble a lot, but maybe I'll ramble more later. We'll see. Okay, so, and I may have said this before, but let me just explain that this first half of the day, we're going to focus on kind of the mechanics of birth and what to expect. The This afternoon after lunch is when we'll actually like get on the floor and do some stretches and do some things. So um, just so if you're sitting here going, God, when are we going to get to the techniques? We're going to get there. But I want to give you, I want to give you all the stuff up here because your mind, okay, you guys have heard mind over matter, right? Or you know just how important your mind is in helping your body get through things. I mean, like positive attitudes in fighting off illnesses, things like that. Like your mind, our minds can do so much more for our bodies than we realize because scientists just don't know enough about our minds, right? But if your head is in the right place, it goes a long, long way in this birth process, okay? So we're gonna focus on that this morning about having your head in the right place, having the right people around you, the right environment around you, and we're gonna talk about why why that I mean if you're if you want to have the scientific explanation not just the feel good oh get your mind right and be happy and everything will be fine we're gonna talk about the science of it too okay so hormones are a key component of regulating your labor and birth some are gonna help you and some are going to hinder prostaglandins act on the cervix to soften and thin it in readiness for labor so we know you know the cervix has to shorten and soften and spread out and in order for that to happen, your prostaglandins have to kick in. Well, oxytocin causes prostaglandins, okay? So, if you guys, you guys have heard of oxytocin, right? Okay, so it's, it can be an accelerator of birth, it causes the uterus to contract after birth, <coughs> and rise in levels that causes mother and baby to fall in love. So, so oxytocin, which I've got a slide here after this, it's, it's the love hormone, okay? So we're just gonna, we're gonna go into each of these a little bit more. Um, endorphins are your uh, nature's opiates. Um, and that's, that's what we're gonna want to kick in. Um, all of this is connected, but the oxytocin will cause the endorphins. The endorphins help reduce pain. And so these two are what you definitely want, okay? Adrenaline is the one that we wanna avoid at all costs, okay? Um, but we're gonna go into each of these uh, a little more in detail. Um, okay, there's my fun slide. <laughs> so when you met your significant other and you started dating, you started falling in love, yes, you fell in love and there were emotions and all that stuff, but you know what? It was also your brain chemicals. It was your oxytocin. When you, when you hug somebody, you know, your kids or your husband or your mom or whoever, when you hug someone, that releases oxytocin. That's what makes you feel good. When someone tells you, man, you know, you look great today, or, you know, that was a, you, you did so good scene, or, you know, whatever, whatever the compliment is. When you get a compliment, that warm, fuzzy feeling all over your body, that's oxytocin that's being released, okay? So, it's just the feel-good hormone, okay? And it's the same hormone that you're going to feel when you get that baby on your chest, and when you start nursing that baby. Oxytocin is what makes your milk uh, let down. Um, it's, you know, it's that cuddly, oh, we're about to bond, and it's going to be great milk lets down, okay? So oxytocin is a great feeling and that's what we want to focus on. So if you're, like I said, if you're of scientific mind and you wanna think of it this way, just keep thinking, how can I make her oxytocin flow? How can I make her feel loved and supported and happy, okay? Okay, so I probably already touched on some of this, but um, it, I'm gonna skip back a little bit. So it's the love hormone, and it's produced when we feel loved and when we love others. Um, just being hugged and support, encouragement. Do you remember the remember the first time when you were, you know, teenager or whatever, and somebody holds your hand for the first time? You know, that first boyfriend you hold hands, and you're just like, oh. I mean, it's just like this all over. I mean, that is like a huge burst of oxytocin. Okay, and you're not in love with them, but that's that's you feel good, right? So that's oxytocin. Um, it is an accelerator of birth. And we're going to get into Pitocin later, but you've heard of Pitocin, right? So Pitocin is the fake oxytocin. It's the chemical, make. I mean, it's what they used, a chemical version of oxytocin, okay? Um, but it's, and it, they're both an accelerator of birth, but the oxytocin that is naturally produced in our body accelerates it at the correct speed, at the correct strength, and it brings about birth the way it's supposed to happen, okay? The way it, or the way it is 
the way our body naturally wants to make it happen is with our own oxytocin. So we want to keep the oxytocin flowing. It causes contractions, and actually contractions produce more oxytocin. I know that sounds crazy, but it's true. You're, so if, if it's causing contractions and the contractions are bringing more oxytocin, then we're having a nice little cycle going on. As long as the contractions are caused, you know, they're caused by the natural oxytocin and they're the right strength, the right timing, and it feels comfortable to our body. I mean, yes, it's, un it's uncomfortable because it's painful, but it's what our body is expecting to happen, then we're right on track. So we want the, the contractions that are caused by oxytocin. When you're done with all of this, it's also what helps you get the placenta out and it helps slow your blood flow. So the oxytocin is, it's key in this whole process from beginning to end. And like I said, when you get baby on skin to skin and you're nursing, you still have oxytocin flowing. And it helps your uterus to go back down to normal size. Now, you guys have been pregnant before. I just had a discussion the other day with some moms and <laughs> you're gonna look pregnant still after you have your baby. And my friend was telling me a story about she just had her daughter maybe two or three days before that. Anyway, she's at home and some kid comes that's doing direct TV or something like that. And he sees the baby or hears the baby and then he looks at my friend and he's like, so you have a baby, but you're pregnant again? And she's like, no, I'm not. You know, like, I'm mean, granted he was 19 years old, so in his defense he didn't know. But the good thing about, so that's just a little side note. If you didn't know that, you know, the uh, Princess Kate and all these other models and celebrities that go right back to what they work for, that's not real life. That doesn't happen. Probably a lot of spandex. Uh, yeah, <laughs> for sure. So, but all that to say that the more the more calm you are, the more relaxed you are, the more supported and comfortable you feel, the more oxytocin is flowing through your body, and it's going to help everything. It's just going to help in the healing process. Okay, it's going to help your uterus go back to the to the size it's supposed to be. Um, it's, you know, you've had a major organ, your placenta has just come out of your body and left this gigantic wound inside your uterus, but the oxytocin helps slow the blood flow and helps all this in the healing process. So when you get home, I'm just going to throw this out there. When you get home, you need to keep all of these things in mind that you need to stay calm and you need to stay supported and secluded and just in your own little bubble with your family. Okay, don't worry about the laundry. Don't worry about the house. Don't worry about any of that stuff. Because the more you stress about that, the less oxytocin you're getting and the less your body is, the slower your body is going to heal. So self-care, okay? Take care of yourself and relax and let your, let your body heal the way it needs to heal, okay? I saw that, this picture the other day about that, about, and I never thought about that. Once your placenta comes out, you have this massive, like, plate-sized wound. I saw that inside one of your organs. I know, you don't think about that because they're not external things that you see healing, right? But that your body needs to heal that stuff. So that's what that's what that time home is, you know, if you have maternity leave or if you're just home in general, that needs to be healing time. Think of, of you just had a major, you know, massive body event. I mean, no, it wasn't a major surgery, but you had a major event happen. So let your body heal. Give yourself a, a break. Don't worry about the baskets of laundry, okay? Okay, um, mother and baby are both flooded with oxytocin as they begin skin to skin bonding and breastfeeding. The oxytocin is also important for your baby. It helps them, you know, their body is brand new, so it's gonna help their body to regulate all their blood sugars and their temperatures, and um, it's just gonna help them to feel calm and safe the more skin to skin you have and the more oxytocin is flowing through you and baby, okay? So oxytocin is our friend, okay? Um, Endorphins. Okay, you guys have heard of endorphins. What do you think of when I say endorphins? When do you think about those kicking in? Anyone? Like adrenaline, the fight or flight. Kind of. Okay, so that's that's going to be a separate hormone. But endorphins are actually the ones that like. Now, I, again, I've never had this because I'm not a runner. But have you ever heard of runners that are that they when they go out and go running, they feel good. They get that you know those really good feelings flowing through their body or cyclists or anybody that does stuff like that. Those, those are endorphins. Those, that's how they get through a marathon. Because things are hurting when you're in a marathon. Your thighs are rubbing together. You're getting blisters on your feet. 
it's not a fun, comfortable experience, but they have endorphins flowing their, through their body because they feel good, because they're doing something, they're doing something they enjoy, they're accomplishing a, a goal, and so they have endorphins that are flowing through their body that are helping as natural pain relievers in their body, so it helps them get through this marathon. Well, think of it that way, think of birth as a marathon, basically. You also want endorphins flowing through you to be your natural pain reducers. So, um, endorphins are hormones secreted within the brain and nervous system in situations of stress and pain. Internal equivalent to painkillers such as morphine, without all the negative side effects, because, you know, we don't really want to be bumping morphine into our body. So, um, if you don't have to. If we can get natural painkillers to be flowing through our body, that's going to be better for us. Um, your level rises towards the end of pregnancy and during labor and each contraction, especially during the second stage of labor, helping to relieve the pain of labor naturally. So um, the good thing is, is that as long as you're staying, you know, like I said, oxytocin and endorphins are connected. You still, I mean, you have to be in a good place. I mean, if you're stressed, which, okay, we'll, we'll just move on to the next thing. High stress is gonna cause low endorphins, which is gonna, you're gonna feel more pain, okay? If you have low stress, higher endorphins, less pain. Just, go, it just kinda makes sense. Um, so you're talking about keeping your stress level down. Well, so what do we wanna do to keep our stress level down? Keep our oxytocin up, right? So, again, that's how these things are connected, is if you're staying calm and you're feeling supported and you're feeling loved, then you're gonna have endorphins that are flowing through and those endorphins are naturally suppressing some of your pain reception, okay? So, like I said, this, I don't know what, what speaks to you more, whether it's just, hey, we need to be in a good place and we're gonna talk about feeling good and all that kind of stuff and just, if you're fine with that, but if you wanna know the science behind it, this is why, okay? So, whichever one helps you through it, guys, sometimes this might help you think about, you know, what do I need to do? Like, if you need steps, well, I need to keep her oxytocin up so that she has endorphins and so she has less pain. If that helps you, there you go. Now we're gonna talk about fight or flight. Okay, so tell me, tell me what you know. Well, before I move on to fight or flight, do you have any questions about oxytocin or endorphins, anything? No? Okay, so tell me what you know about fight or flight. What have you heard without reading? <laughs> any, anybody? Um, <clears throat> like it's your, it's your body's natural kind of, like motivation to protect yourself. Right. So it kicks in when you are, when you feel like you're in danger, right? Or you get scared. I mean, like, you know, the, I don't know about you guys, my husband thinks it's hilarious to like sneak up and scare me, you know, or hide behind a corner or whatever. That, that's adrenaline, you know, and then you're like, oh, okay. Or, you know, you're home by yourself and I'm a scary cat and then every little noise sets you off, right? Okay, so that's your fight or flight reaction in your body. It's brought on by adrenaline. Um, definition is the instinctive physiological response to a threatening situation which readies one to either resistibly, resist forcibly or to run away. So fight or flight. Um, the main reason you guys want to avoid adrenaline at all costs is it can shut down your labor. It can slow it down and it can completely shut it down. How many of you guys, in these birth stories that you've heard, have someone has said, well, you know, I went in and everything was going along fine, and then I just stopped. I just quit progressing. Nothing was happening. Okay, this isn't necessarily what happened, but it could be what happened is that if at any point you didn't feel calm and safe and comfortable and something in your deep primal subconscious was like, mm, this doesn't feel right this may not be a safe place for this baby to, to, to come out. Not that, you, not that you feared where you were or anything, and you, don't, you probably on, on, some, on no level had any idea that this is what was happening. But that can be what stops your labor, is your body just goes, hmm, I don't know about this environment. And this, that's what's amazing about our bodies, is it can do that. Okay, so let's think about a cave woman, you know, thousand, how many years ago, I don't know. How long ago that would be, but but yeah. So she's in a, you know a cave by herself, having this baby, or you know going into labor and all that kind of stuff. And then she hears this like 
horrible roaring sound outside, you know, like a lion or something that wants to come eat her baby, right? Okay, well, so she doesn't feel safe all of a sudden because she knows she's going to be vulnerable. I mean, or her body does anyways. She knows it and her body knows it. So what does her body do? You're not having this baby right now. It's okay. We can stop this. So stops labor and you go someplace safe. So I'm going to give you some other examples of the same thing. How many of you have had cats or dogs that have had litters growing up? Okay. Where do they go? Where did where do they go to have their babies? She tried to have her litter in my bed. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Any other examples? Can you think of where do where do you think of when you think of an animal like a cat or a dog or any animal small, having their offspring? Awesome. Right. And why do they go there? Because it's where they feel protected. Right. They feel safe. I remember um, at my great grandparents' house out on our farm here in the south of the town, they had, um, their front porch was just completely hollowed out underneath, you know, like it was just this little hole under a porch. There's this dog that every one of her litters, that's where she went. That was her safe place because it's protected. She can see everything that's coming. It's dark. Um, so she felt safe there. Okay. Think about cattle. Okay. Now, a lot of times you guys, you know, that, you know, if a farmer knows that this this particular cow is about to have a calf. Well, we're going to keep it up here where we can keep an eye on it. We're going to keep it in a pen, right? But if you didn't put it in a pen, where is it, where's it going to go? Off by itself to where no one's around. Exactly. They're going to go off into some woods. They're going to go somewhere where they can they can hide it when once it's born. Because for an animal, their biggest fear is something's going to come eat their baby, right? Okay, well, that, you know, obviously that's not what we fear, but, but it's the same idea. So... The other thing that can happen, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this or not, but it's the same idea with cats and dogs and stuff. They might be going into labor and you think everything's going fine. They might even have a couple of, of their babies. But then, say it's a cat and all of a sudden it hears a dog barking or you know something, something threatening. Well, that cat's birth is going to stop. That cat has time to take those new babies and go somewhere else and finish having their babies. Right? So... Think of yourself as an animal then at this point, or a cave person, or whatever. Your body still has those same instincts, okay? Again, you're probably not, a, you're not fearful that you're in mortal danger in your hospital room, right? You don't feel that. Um, you don't think anybody's coming to eat your baby, you know? It's not the same fears, but it's the same idea. That if you're not calm, if you're brain is not in the right place and you're not feeling loved and supported I'm not, okay I don't think this would happen to any of your families but let's just say that you have you know several different family members in and out of your hospital room maybe a couple of them don't get along or maybe you don't get along with one of them and you end up having some big huge fight you know it's Jerry Springer moment right you know in your hospital room do you feel calm and supportive and safe and if you don't feel that way, your body's going to go, mm, this is obviously not the environment that this baby needs to come out in. And it's just going to slow everything down. And you're going to be like, what? I was in, you know, we were trucking along. I was getting dilated. This was going along great. What happened? Well, your fight or flight kicked in. And you might not have felt a huge surge of adrenaline, but you're not necessarily going to know what's happening. But, but that's, what, that's what can happen. This is, again, guys, like I said before, if you remember nothing, your job is to keep her calm, to make her feel supported. If it means you have to kick out family members, guess what? Now, you can also talk to your nursing staff, okay? I mean, a lot of them are willing to do that. They will, you know, say, oh, well, she really needs some rest, and they, they won't put it off on you. They won't say that you asked for it, but if you need a break from people, if there's somebody that's bringing down the vibe, you know, and saying negative things, you know, pull your nurse aside or, or tell your husband, say, hey, go ask the nurse to kick these people out. I need, I need to be alone, okay? This is about you. This is about your goal, you and your baby. This is about what you have in mind for you and your baby, so don't feel bad about it. And get over it. the hospital, you don't want anybody coming in, and they will check IDs. Yep. Mm -hmm. They'll keep them out. They'll play bodyguard. That is totally true. Are you guys going to the, if you've been up to the, nurse, the OB floor yet, you have to be buzzed in to the OB floor. Like, you have to walk past the nurse's station, you have to tell them where they're going, 
So if you have people that you don't want there, like I had people I didn't want there, she had people she didn't want there, they won't let those people in. So another thing, they they don't. It's not a mandatory thing now, but they used to make it to where you had to have proof of your whooping cough shot. Oh, if you didn't get it, they wouldn't let you in. They don't have that now, but if you don't want someone in your room that didn't get the shot, you can have them check for that information. Good to know. That is good to know. I didn't know that. Um, you know the other thing that you can agree to. I mean. You might feel like you need to tell your family this, but one of the easiest ways to avoid all of that is if you know for sure that you just want it to be you two and you two and you and yours, don't call anybody. Or just call and text the people you trust. Say, okay, look, she's in labor and we're going in, but we don't want everybody and the brother showing up, so don't, don't say anything, you know? This is your private moment, okay? You're not obligated to tell anybody. They're gonna get to see that baby when it gets here. They're gonna, if you know, if they are your family and they love you, they're gonna know that baby for the rest of its life. This is your time, okay? And again, this is your goal. This is what you set for yourself. So what it takes to make that happen is what you need to do. So if you feel comfortable, especially if it's middle of the night, oh, wouldn't it be great if you went into labor at like, you know, 10 o'clock at night and have the baby in the middle of the night and you don't even have to worry about it, hopefully. You'd be like, oh, we wanted to let you sleep. So we just figured we'd tell you, you know, that you got here. <laughs> My sister would murder me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know, you know what family relations will allow that and what won't. But um, if you can get away with it and if, if that's really what you want, it's just the two of you, then do what it takes to make that happen. Okay? And, and like I said before, if the people around you are supportive of your goal and you can you can explain all this stuff to them like look you know I don't want to be walking around you know half naked in pain going through all this stuff with an audience and that's gonna make me feel uncomfortable so that's gonna make it harder for me to reach my goal because I'm not gonna feel calm and, and you know protected and all that kind of stuff so I don't really want an audience you know, if you explain it to them in those terms, it's not just because, oh, I don't like you and I don't want you there. You know, it, it's nothing personal. And hopefully they'll understand that, okay? I know, I know family, it's, it can be touchy, but, you know, <laughs> I, yeah, she was fine. You know, I, I didn't even know any of this stuff when I was, you know, when I was having mine. And actually ours was in the middle of the night and we already had a, son so they were watching him so it just inadvertently happened that we were by ourselves I think we would have been fine I don't think we would have been you know screaming at each other and I would have been wouldn't have been kicking her out but but again if you know I mean you might dearly love your sister or your mother-in-law or whoever you might dearly dearly love them but you know without a shadow of a doubt that if they're in that room they're gonna stress you out they're gonna tick you off and you're going to be not calm if you know that then by all means do your best to try to figure out a way to not have them in there so that you can do what you need to do so that you can focus on what you need to do guys if you have to talk to your own mothers bite that bullet okay <laughs> just saying like you know but again if they're supportive of your goal and like, and I hope that they are I really do I think I think in natural birth and in breastfeeding and in all these things that they're natural and they're things that we should be doing they're, they're not easy though and it's because we don't have the examples anymore it's because we're not surrounded by it all the time it's getting better but one of the biggest things is just having that support you know years ago it was just taken for granted that that's just I mean, that's how you give birth and so the, there wasn't a lot of negative Nellies around going oh, you can't do it they're hoping that woman can do it because, you know, they don't really have any other choice, you know, years ago before we had all these interventions and stuff. But anyways, I'm getting off topic. Um, so I just want to encourage you to think about who you're surrounding yourself with. Okay, let me do one more slide and then I think we are going to take a break. Okay, I'm glad I did this one. So this is the cycle you want to avoid, obviously. So the more fear you have about anything, it doesn't matter what it is, but we're talking about birth. But let's say you fear getting a tattoo. Let's say you fear, um, well, 
if you're a person that fears taking a test, it might not even be related to pain, but anything that you are afraid of because you're unfamiliar